Spanish cooking has some of the most vibrant and exciting flavors in the world of food. But why? Why does everything here taste so good? What makes the food here so Spanish? I've never seen so much saffron in my entire life. I've come to the town of Alicante in the region of Valencia because this is the traditional home of tapas and paella. So I figure it's a good place to eat, drink, and learn a thing or two. And I know exactly the guy to do that with, a food hunter. So Michael, you know that paella is one of the typical dishes from Spain, and especially here in Alicante, we are very proud of our paellas. Patrick de la Cueva scours the countryside looking for the best of the best of Spanish artisan food products. He then exports them all over the world. Naturally, that means he's got the inside track on the food scene around here. And I thought that maybe you would like to join me with some of my friends in a country house. Sure. And then we can cook a paella. Yeah, sure. Spanish food and culture has been influenced by many of the Arabic countries along the Mediterranean. One of Spain's most famous dishes is paella. It's cooked over an open fire in a very unique pan. So do you always go to a hardware store to buy kitchen gear? Here, in fact, they have a good selection of paella pans. Oh, Buenos yeah. dias. Una paella? Sí. This, this is perfect for six, sí. seven people. Tienes que secarla bien y ponerle un poquito de aceite para conservarla. This paella pan is made of iron. It's the classic paella pan, the way it has always been. When we make a paella, we want to have something very white, so all the rice gets the same heat at the same time. Okay. Do you like your pan? Now that's a souvenir, right there. So we are going to prepare a paella in a country house, the traditional way. Sure. But in the meantime, I'm starving. El Canto has served traditional tapas for many, many years. Tapas is a series of small tastes, appetizers. The food may be fast, but it's obvious that quality comes first. Fresh. Cheers. Cheers. My, my first taste of Spain. Miguel really cares for finding the best raw material. And the food doesn't need to be very elaborated, basically. No. People, when they get off work, they go have a small beer, a glass of wine, before going home for lunch, and then they have something very light. And gradually, this has become a way of also eating, even having lunch. Tapas also is going to different places. You don't need to sit in the same place all the time. So, so the tradition is to start in one place, have a few tastes, and then go to another place? Sure. Montaditos is a small sandwich. The local ham, ham, sure. Lomo. Pork loin, chego cheese, chego cheese okay. on, Esbergena y aubergine sodomi. with uh, filet. Mm. This is not like normal ham at home. This is, this is the good stuff. Here's That's the tapas. <laughs> Cheers. That was really cool. Awesome. Tapas is a very traditional part of Spanish cuisine. But for chef Maria Jose San Roman, tapas comes with a modern twist. Patrick yeah. says that uh, this is the best tapas in Spain. Well, what, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Salud. Salud. No tapas experience is complete without Iberian ham. Considered by many connoisseurs to be the very best in the world, its rich flavor comes from special pigs that are fed acorns. This is good quality. What are you looking for here? If the fat is melting at room temperature, that means that the quality of the ham is very good, which means that the pork ate a lot of acorn. This doesn't taste salty to me at all. There's a savoriness, a richness to it that I've not like had before. Nutty. It is nutty. We work with these people of the ham for 20 years, so now we have a dealer that we trust. We want the best ham, we order, and we get it. That's how it works. So what is this now? It, looks, it just looks like bread with tomato, really. We call this crystal bread. Mm. This isn't about the bread. 
The bread's just crispy. This is about the tomato. That's amazing. Everybody's got tomatoes, but we have a winter variety, which is called R R A F, Raf. This is the rough tomato. It's a very sweet tomato for the winter. Very fragrant, almost perfumed. It's there's, better than the summer ones. Yeah, it, it, there's, an air, there's an aroma to this that, that I've nuts. not tried before. It's nuts. Mm. Sweet. This is one of the best tomatoes I've ever eaten. So here you can also try some tuna roll and the tuna meat. This is tuna roll? Tuna roll. We pay very expensive for this. Isn't that good? It's very good. It's briny. It's salty, but it's good salty. It has that uh, umami, you, you, you know, that, umami. That, that savory, delicious flavor. And you should try this. Those are very special. So what is that called? What kind it's of olive? It's gordal, which means fat. Gordal, fat. Big. big. It fat. is a big olive. Yes. I thought you were just being polite, putting some olives over here. You know, no, 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 no. Kinda, no, no, no. Those it's are, a star. I told you, the amazing. bread and the olives are the stars. This is the most traditional tapa in Spain, bravas, which are made with saffron. Really? With saffron? Yes. Mm. No more secrets in the kitchen in Spain. You can ask me any single thing we have here, I will tell you the recipe or where do I buy this. And I can even show you how it works with saffron. If you ask me to try anything with saffron in it, I'll try it. You want to have a saffron cappuccino? Mm, I'm amazed at how well those flavors work together. I really am. This is Alicante in the Valencia region of Spain. This is the perfect place to explore the culture of Spanish food and find out what makes it one of the world's great cuisines. Cooks are always motivated by our ingredients. They're the raw materials that inspire the art of cooking, so the best cooks understand that it takes the best ingredients for the best cooking. Like an all saffron tasting menu prepared by one of Spain's greatest chefs, Maria Jose San Roman. This is Monastrel. This is Chef Maria's signature restaurant. This is where she's helping to find the new age of Spanish cooking. This is where she gets to play. Hi. Hi, Michael. What are you making? You want to have a saffron cappuccino? If you ask me to try anything with saffron in it, I'll try it. Saffron cappuccino. <laughs> I'm amazed at how well those flavors work together. I really am. This is Spanish saffron. It's like, it's alive. It's like wine. Nobody thinks about saffron. They just keep it in the kitchen for years and years and years. They never use it. So when you realize that you only need a little, little bit, you, you will become crazy about using saffron for everything. Because tiny saffron threads can be so hard to count, to weigh, or to measure, Chef Maria has created a standardized system. She infuses the saffron in water using a consistent concentration. It's then easily and accurately measured. Maria uses saffron infusions, saffron powder, and saffron threads in just about everything in her kitchen. Nothing is off limits. And we are going to make like a salad. So turnips, pumpkin, carrot. Whatever available, we cut it vegetables in. Vegetables in general. Yeah, okay, and this is a lemongrass ice cream. Lemongrass ice cream, and what are those? This is fisalis. That's what they call yeah. wild tomatoes in, in oh, South America. Gooseberry. Now we always try to put some flowers all over our desserts because they make so nice. Again, saffron caramel. So those last little threads, the saffron that's already given up its flavor, but not its color or its form. So they, garnish. But they will eat the flavor. Mmm. Oh, wow. I was a little skeptical of the root vegetable. Mm -hmm. But it's beautiful. And the lemongrass, the saffron, and then these little uh, gooseberries. They're, uh, they're nice and sour. There's a good balance of contrast here. I think that's the biggest thing I'm learning here today is that saffron is better when it's subtle. And I, and I think I've just been using too much of it. So what do we have on the plate? We have these nice rough tomatoes, shrimps, yes. Mussels. Mussels, sea bass is locally cut. We are going to make a little bit of saffron caviar. 
which will make a bit of decoration. So you've added some sodium alginate to this? Mm, yes. And there's calcium chloride in the That's it. In the water. That's it. Fish matches very, very, very well with saffron. It's fun. It's fun. I mean, look, Why not? It's saffron caviar. It's... And it matches with the fish, Good. like salmon rose. We can make an infusion of, of saffron with tea. Well, I'm past the point where I'm surprised <laughs> at all the things you can do with saffron. Of course you can. Can I go? Yeah. It's good enough, ah, huh? Ah, look at that. Hey! Buenos dias. Hi, hey, buddy. How, How are, are you? you? Gosh, have we been I using do. your saffron today? Do you want some tea? Yeah, why not? We've come all the way from saffron-flavored coffee to saffron-flavored tea and everything in between. In fact, I've got to write all this down. I want to take a little saffron and see what happens. My, my day with the saffron queen. <laughs> you can also stick some saffron threads. Beautiful. Saffron flavor will dissolve in fat, but not saffron color. That's it. I'm writing down all your secrets. Thank you. No more secrets in the kitchen. That's true. Finish. So. This is Nobelda, the place where we have the factory. Saffron warehouse. Exactly. Now that I've learned some of Maria's secrets, Patrick is going to let me in on a few of his. He has his own saffron factory. Holy cow, you weren't kidding. Look at that. Well, this is a Spanish saffron. You can just smell it, feel it, get a, mm. a bit of idea of what it is. I've never seen so much saffron in my entire life. Mm. So what these ladies here are doing is checking all the saffron, finding all this kind of of stuff, they take it away so that we make sure that we only get 100% saffron. So how do you know if this is the very best saffron? Well, a lower quality of saffron will have shorted filaments. Second thing, what we see is a bright red color. So you just sort of hold that into the light and that, that, that sort of luminescent color indicates that it's fresh as well? Exactly. Also make sure that each flower of saffron has three stigmas. That's what exactly. it looks like inside that's the That's the image you have to keep in your mind of what is real saffron. Can we take a picture? Sure. How much do you think we need for paella today? About half a gram. Think that's enough? Yes. There's our precious saffron for our authentic Spanish paella. Well, let's continue with the salad. <laughs> this is a bit crazy what we are doing. Maybe I am out of a bit of a limb here. I've come to Alicante, Spain on a mission to find the secrets behind the flavors of authentic Spanish cuisine. Patrick de la Cueva is a professional food hunter. We're on the trail of fresh ingredients for the local traditional rice dish, paella. What are the ingredients that you have to use to make it a paella? And are there certain things that you, you can't use? We are going to do a paella with rabbits and snails, which is a traditional way of doing paella in this part of Alicante. Un conejo para una paella. One rabbit, please. I don't get to say that at the butcher every day. <laughs> are these wild rabbits or are they farm raised? They are farm raised. Farm raised. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you. So, Michael, while we're doing the paella, we can have some appetizers, like uh, some tomato salad with some dried fish. Okay. Mojama is the dried loin of the tuna. So it's like the ham of the sea, tuna loin. Exactly. So it's traditional to eat the mojama, the tuna loin, with almonds? Yes, here so in this area, too. Why don't, we, why don't we get some almonds and put those in the tomato salad, too? So what, what are these now? This is a smoked tuna with a gherkin and a little bit of lemon peel. And is it ever good? good. Muchas gracias. So, rice, rice, rice. The bomba rice is a rice that is produced in Valencia. Bomba! Por favor, señor. Bomba! <laughs> So let's go and buy some tomatoes. Yeah, this is the, the wrap. Those are the ones we had at Maria's. A red pepper for the sofrito? Yes. So I need an onion for my uh, seasoning. We can use also this. It's a fresh garlic. And you would use this in your paella? Para la paella. 
Okay, sold. Okay. Gracias. 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 So let's see, rabbit, tuna, almonds, tomato salad, rice, vegetables, we're good to go. We're heading to a country house that belongs to one of Patrick's colleagues, Anna Marina. She just happens to be an expert paella cook. Gracias, Anna Marina. It's my amigo Michael. Your name is Michael. Here's all the stuff. This is Sandra. Nice Hello, to meet you. how are you? Gusta? We are going to begin to treat the snails. Oh, look, look at inside. Them. Yeah, they're all over the place. Sure. Yes. What are they eating in there? Thyme. Thyme. Oh, yeah. So they're eating the herb. Yes. Free range herb fed wild snail <laughs> in the paella. <laughs> Bring it on. After a quick rinse, the snails are left out in the sun to coax them out of their shells before cooking. Oh, the water's warm now, okay. If it is too hot, it wouldn't come out. Now they feel like if they're in a spa, yeah. in a warm bath. But little by little, we will warm up this, and finally they will die. Do we need some garlic peel? Yeah. We put it whole. Put it whole? Si. So we cut around the garlic, but sort of halfway through, and this is going to flavor the sofrito. And with this cut, we give them a space to look. I've never seen that before. First step to the paella. Sofrito, the flavor base. Little by little, we have to conduct the flavors of the different ingredients into the oil. Into the oil. And then we will put everything together once it is half cooked. Here comes our rabbit. And Edina, you are the boss. She really knows. I mean, when I read about paella, everybody wants to talk about authenticity. You have to use this, you have to use this, and no way can you use that. In a paella, the important thing is that all the flavors are in the rice. We can even have a paella with no other thing than, than rice if we have done the sofrito properly. The tradition is to use what's around you, really. So the rabbit's nice and brown. Many Spanish dishes begin with a flavor base known as the sofrito. It's a mixture of onions, garlic, and tomatoes slowly stewed in olive oil. I think this is ready. This is ready? Yep. The oil to... is separated, and, and that's what it means it's ready. So we put in here the saffron. That's it? This is enough for six. We're going to boil the rabbit to make a stock. A little bit of salt in there? Right. Nutmeg. Nutmeg, all right. Instead of this, can we use the fresh rosemary? It can get uh, bitter. It can get better if you use the fresh, so better to use the dried. Los caracoles, the snails. Oh. The garlic also. Okay, the garlic. Yeah. With the rabbit and snail broth ready, it's time to assemble the paella. Spanish short grain rice is the key to great paella because as it cooks, it absorbs flavors without becoming sticky or mushy. It retains its chewy texture, and it's also locally grown. And it's not really something that gets stirred, is it? You have to let the rice boil without touching it. Oh. The grains of rice should not stick one to the other. It's nice and tender. I gotta get a picture of this. It's beautiful. Ta -ta. Here we go. Each of us takes a fork and we just eat from the pot. Oh, it's nice and tender. Oh, it's very nice. I'm in the Spanish countryside with my friend Patrick and his friends. So we're making what everybody cooks for a party here, paella, over a traditional wood fire. And it's almost ready. They arrived. Hey, <laughs> hi, Michael. Hi. 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 So instead of vinegar, you use a lemon yeah. to give the sour. Yeah, squeeze the whole lemon right in. 
This is a bit crazy what we are doing. Really? To, to mix tomatoes and tuna, of course, is, is well, very tomatoes standard. Tomatoes and tuna is very standard. And the onions, of course. But you, by using the lemon juice and the almonds, that makes it... That makes it different. Yeah. Really? Okay. I, I have to admit, I've never actually made an almond tomato salad, so maybe I am out on a bit of a limb here. That's the adventurous part of the salad. Here we go. And with that, a brand new Spanish salad is created. So this is good, eh? This is ready to go. We'll call this Ensalada Miguel y Patrick. Okay. <laughs> Ta -ta -ta. Here we go. Each, each of us takes a fork. Really? Okay. And we just eat from the pan. Bueno. Okay. Dig in. It better be good after so much work. Awesome. And the saffron's coming through loud and clear. We didn't use that much saffron, did we? No, we didn't really.